Hey folks, welcome to the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel. Today I'm speaking with MIT PhD Dr. Keith Duggar. We had a really interesting conversation. We spoke about interpretability, the dichotomy between inductive priors and experience in machine learning models. We also spoke about GPT-3 and whether it's reasoning. We went through uh, one of Gary Marcus's articles. There's a lot of discussion at the moment about whether or not a neural network can reason, what it means to reason. And Keith was making an interesting argument that any reasoning conception can be unrolled and can be turned into something like a neural network. So why are they not reasoning? It's always a, a great conversation talking with Keith. Are you a paper author? Would you like to come and have a philosophical discussion with us? please reach out to me on LinkedIn. I would love to have a conversation with you. Machine Learning Street Talk does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a street talk. It's just a conversation with some random people. And every single week, it's going to be a different set of people. And we want to facilitate some really interesting conversations. So if you'd like to be involved in street talk, reach out to us. Remember to like, comment and subscribe. We always really enjoy reading your comments. So make sure you write at least something and we will see you back next week oh boy yeah i'm enjoying this uh, this book actually the, the which one we've been kind of, what was it again interpret interpretable machine learning oh what have you read on it molnar's books so yeah i've been looking i like it for a lot of reasons so it's a very good sort of survey right of, of what's happening these days what's out there presented in a clean simple way i like the the taxonomy kind of section that lays out a very clear definition of all the terms. It, it almost strikes me as uh, somebody took part of their thesis and, and published it as a book. <laughs> so so for me, I quite like it. So, yeah, uh, oh, that's a beautiful book. Yeah, and it, and it, how do I say this? It strikes a chord with me because I think he doesn't shy away from pointing out a lot of the limitations of what's going on here. But I also, I've also discovered some, at least from my perspective, some interesting higher level thoughts about what's going on in this book. So for example, he talks a lot about, if, if we go to, let's see what the section is here. If we go to properties of explanations. I love this section. That's uh, 2.5 because it sets up at a high level, right? What are we trying to achieve here? And the very first one, expressive power, right? Expressive power is the language or structure of the explanations the method is able to generate. An explanation method could generate if-then rules, decision trees, weighted sum, natural language, or something else. And that, to me, I realized, <laughs> okay, so we're trying to explain these models. And we need some kind of language to explain them. Uh, yeah. And I'm using language in very general sense, just any kind of symbolics, images, whatever. We need some kind of language, right, to explain these things to people. And if you read on through the book and you start looking at the languages that are used to explain these models, they're all complicated. They're not layman's term languages. They're things like look at this box plot for example, and see how it has bars with different widths representing variation. And here's all the data points or, or the feature points for a particular set in the data, or check out these graphs, see how they're curving in this way or that way. They're all quite mathematical. Right? And in the case of the neural networks, the, the language that they're trying to say, the neural networks for image recognition, the language that's being used to describe them is various kinds of images that vary in form from mind-bending abstract paintings or something to things that just don't make any sense to a human being at all. And so what's striking me about that is that are we really solving the problem here? We're going from one complicated representation, if you will, like just take the simple context of a, a linear model. Here's my 0.127 of X plus 0.127 of X1, et cetera. And maybe I can tell you what those variables are, but it's a mathematical yeah. structure. And then we go, and in order to explain that, we've got this other mathematical structure for you to look at. Right? <laughs> no, I, I completely agree. The first thing I like to articulate is that no machine learning model is verbalizable. What we are dealing with here uh, are trade-offs. 
I think one of the first things that Molnar said in his book is that I've got a, a quote here somewhere. Yeah, the, the problem is that a single metric such as classification accuracy is an incomplete description of most real world tasks. And it does beg the question, why are we making this trade off? Can we have our cake and eat it? The answer is no, we can't because models that are increasingly complex have a, a better predictive accuracy most of the time. And there are loads of trade-offs as well. So for example, we're trading off privacy versus accuracy or fairness versus accuracy or privacy versus fairness or accuracy versus explainability or even explainability versus security. So there's no right or wrong way to do it. And these explainability methods, they at best give you a looking glass into the rough behavior of a model. So I think a lot of the motivation be t behind explainability, if you will, for uh, machine learning models, at least a big chunk of it, is to be able to get the public to be satisfied with them or to be happy with them or to be able to justify to just an average citizen why they didn't get their mortgage or why they didn't get the grades that they were expecting to, to get on their you know uh, a levels right so <clears throat> so if if we understand that a big portion of our motivation here is to be able to explain what these complicated complex models are doing to the general public we've got a long way to go <laughs> because yeah. I like one of the examples in there is a decision tree. And I remember the first time I ever looked at a decision tree that I had fit to some data set. I started thinking, man, this is an arbitrary piece of junk. It's I've got all these nodes in there. If X is less than 0.153 and then further down, if X is greater than 0.11. And I'm just like, there's all these arbitrary sort of little cutoffs in there. And, and there's a quote in the, I thought this was funny in the book because he says, and, I, and by the way, nothing I say is I'm not attributing any of this to Molnar's personal beliefs. I think he's really presenting this in a very kind of survey-like objective sort of way. So he's just capturing, right, what the overall sentiment is. Because I think he's, I think I'm probably on the same page with him on a lot of things, just reading between the lines, if you will. But he says in there about uh, good explanations here, trees create good explanations. The tree structure automatically invites one to think about predicted values for individual instances of counterfactuals. For example, if a feature had been greater or smaller than, than the split point, right? To me, those are actually terrible explanations, right? Like anytime there's this arbitrary number that I'm looking at in isolation, like I'm looking at this node, man, if only I had scored 89 on that test instead of 88. I, I wonder what he meant by that counterfactuals thing. I, I, I think he's saying that some of the more geometric inspired approaches, the decision boundary is a little bit more esoteric and much harder for us to understand. So for us to create a counterfactual example on a decision tree, we could quite literally pivot on one of the decisions, especially yeah. if it was a categorical variable and make it orange instead of red. Well, no, it's just like, or the example I just gave, you know, I, I didn't get to a level I was looking for. Let me see the decision tree. Right. And I go and take a look at this thing and they look nasty to start with, but I go in there and I find some node where I went left instead of right. And it says uh, grade on XYZ exam greater than 80, 88. A and I look at that, damn it. If only I'd have scored an 89, I would have gotten, because you're looking at this very myopic, isolated cutoff point there. And in fact, there's plenty of tree below that. So it's not just that it was like less than 89. There's other things below maybe that happened. I don't know. I'd have to traverse the whole tree, probably complicated. So my point is it's deceptive. Like it, going back to this kind of, um, you know, that there are deceptive indicators or features that maybe sometimes we have to ignore because they lead us down the wrong path. It's a deceptively good explanation. And I, I believe people think it is because they can find that one little spot. If only I had done this differently. Right in this counterfactual world, if only I had I had done, maybe if only I hadn't have gotten a divorce, right? <laughs> or if only I hadn't have had that car wreck, right? Then then something would be different. And so it lets people focus on that. 
but I think in a deceptive way that just makes them feel like, okay, now I understand when actually they don't understand because it's part of this massively complicated decision tree. That, that's right. And because I, I would go a step further and many decision trees, random forests, for example, it generates many decision trees and it takes the mode over the results of all of them. So that's mm -hmm. another layer of indirection because you would be tracing down several right. decision trees. But also what's interesting about decision trees is they, they're based on the ID3 algorithm, which just cursively goes through all of the attributes and looks at the, the Shannon entropy. Uh, and then it just selects the ones that in order that give you the most information gain. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting as opposed to deep neural networks is it doesn't look at any interaction between the features. So it looks at all of them individually. And what may well happen statistically is there's a kind of inflection point. So if you're if you're more than 25 years old, that might be super important. And 26 might be very different from 25. But if you were looking at the explanation, you might not realize that. Yeah, well, so I as an educated scientist, I've sort of been highly attuned to be highly skeptical of arbitrary cutoffs like that. Because I know it's not I know it's not literally 26 years old minus one day where something magical happened, right? It's more <laughs> like there's a noisy, fuzzy population here, right? And, and maybe this was the whatever 95th percentile or something, right? And by the way, that can, our, that can change depending on when we update the data. Maybe today it's 26 years old minus two days because we added a couple data points, but whatever. I know what's happening behind the scenes there is this messy, fuzzy distribution. And we've got a bunch of people who, because of their location in this bell curve, get routed off into some other part of a decision tree. And and I tend to think, I tend to think with a, a lot of variables in life, that's a very perverse way of structuring it. I'd much rather see a more continuous sort of thing, which is say, every day below age 26, you are some factors. It's in other words, regression. I'm much more interested in kind of continuous regression approaches to things rather than these types of cutoffs. There are some yeah. things, sure, that it makes sense to have a cutoff. Have you been in a car accident before or not? Okay. We don't really have data that tells how close you got to getting into a car accident. Maybe you've swerved and avoided by a couple inches 20 times. You don't have that data. But the variable itself, have you been in a car accident, I'm sure is quite informative. But then there are these other things that we end up with these cutoffs on. Age, number of children in the class. I was starting to think after our algo shambles, suppose that they decide to continue using that algorithm. <laughs> what we're going to see is people are going to want to make sure all their classes are 14 students. It's like a, a kid's going to come and apply because of that 15 cutoff in there. I forget if it was less yeah. than or less than or equal to. Let's say it's less than. It's like, wow, this is a great school. Jimmy would really like to come here. We'd love to have him. He scored well on the test. Uh, thing is, we've got 14 students. And we if we add him to this class, then we're going to hit that 15 cutoff and <laughs> all our grades are going to be diminished. <laughs> so, so it's kind of like, and it, you know, once we get five more students, we can set up a new class that has six people and then, then Jimmy can come. That's incredibly dangerous because what you're talking yeah. about are the perils of people gamifying the system. Because you could argue that the system needs to be transparent. Everyone needs to understand how it works. And decision trees are more transparent because they essentially generate rules. They're verbalizable and they're understandable. But the the problem there is that, as you say, now people are going to know that they can't have 15 people in their class because they right. won't get the grades. So maybe we should stay transparent, but we should update the model regularly so that doesn't happen anymore. No, I think the answer is to get rid of, of these kind of sharp boundaries like that. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be 15. It should be something like some function of the number of students. Let's say 0.01 times the number of students gets subtracted from a grade or some parameter. And maybe that parameter gets updated on a regular basis. But we just got to go to more. We've got to go to models that are less discontinuous. And I'm using continuous a bit loosely there because obviously we're talking about a discrete variable on that, though we could make a deep learning model which was completely continuous and more esoteric but we would still reasonably need to explain to people how it worked so we would then use something like lime or 
there was something called Lime Anchors, by the way, by Marco mm-hmm. Ribeiro. And what that does essentially is it decomposes a model into a series of if-then-else rules. So it turns it back into a decision tree. Um, right, yeah. So then or people would just game it tree. again. But, yeah. but that's what I'm pointing out here is that it's this odd thing that trees, if-then-else rules, they're deceptively explainable. But I don't think they really are. I think they're more, they give people a distraction. You can make them think they understand what's going on because they can focus on the one one node that they regret in life having done. <laughs> and and they, they can feel like, okay, I get it. I had that car accident when I was 16 and that's why all these you know things have happened to me. But it's really not the explanation because it's actually this complex decision tree with a bunch of other factors. So it's just, I think it's a, a funny, I don't want to say it's a paradox because uh, anything in life can be a paradox to somebody, right? <laughs> it's more like just a curious feature. of. But, but in a way, it's similar to ourselves, right? We are incredibly um, biased in lots of ways and we confabulate. So we see patterns where there are none and we delude ourselves that we understand the reason why we or other people do things and it's it's wonderful to see people do this on the fly oh yeah that must be because of xyz and you can just tell their reasoning is faulty and sometimes you don't want to pull them up on it surely it's better that there's some quantitative transparent process to deriving the reasoning yeah and it's funny you mentioned the uh, the failings of human logic or or lack of logic or intuition because that that's actually again explicitly brought up in the book here there's a quote that says, good explanations are consistent with prior beliefs of the explainee. Humans tend to ignore information that is inconsistent with prior beliefs. The effect is confirmation bias, right? Yeah. So we're all very familiar with conservation <laughs> bias. And, <laughs> and conservation bias, uh, it's not good from a logical perspective. I, I, th- I, I forget what the sort of evolutionary psychologists say is the origin of it. You may have been useful in the past and maybe it could still be useful. I don't know, but it's certainly not logical. And yet we're saying that explanations are good if they conform to the faulty psychology of people. And so we're almost telling ourselves, yeah, the real problem with all these sort of machine learning models is they're just too logical. We need to uh, get away from logic and start incorporating some feeling and human emotions into them. And yeah. that's what makes for good explanations. But if you think about it, we have a confirmation bias and it's analogous to the learning rate in a machine learning model. So we are programmed to learn quite slowly and to be quite conservative and to assume what we know is right. And we've imbued exactly the same behavior into machine learning models. Yeah, but not quite, because in the machine learning models, even though a new data point by itself is obviously not going to have as much weight as all the prior data that you've observed, it has some weight. Whereas what happens in conversa- uh, confirmation bias is it's like people just totally ignore it. And more so they when they're going out to search for data points, they take all the data points that are in this sort of analogy that you made of low probability and truncate them from the data set. And they keep all the ones that are high probability, and then those just become part of the data set now. So actually, we do something quite different in machine learning, which is we take essentially every data point counts. And just because a data point is low probability doesn't mean it gets truncated. And I'm, I'm alighting that I understand there's outlier methods and, and analysis or something, but that's far different from the way humans implement confirmation bias. If you went down to just a few samples, say a dozen, which is typically the kind of samples that people are going to be dealing with when they're developing their viewpoints or understanding a model or whatever, then it would have much more of an impact. If you removed an outlier, or and I say outlier loosely, if you removed a something that wasn't in the normal population of a data set of size 12, or 15, let's choose 15. That's what the UK government likes. <laughs> I like 12, but 15 going to have a much bigger impact. So I think that's, we just have to be careful with this analogy. I think confirmation bias in people, the way in which we implement it is far more pernicious. Let's come back to the explanations because we want to have trustworthy explanations. We can also distinguish between an explainable model and an explanation. Sure. So an, ex- an explanation is I've just a- applied for a credit card and you're the bank and you say, no, Tim, you're not having a credit card. I say, why? 
and you say your um, debt ratio is greater than 1.2 and you defaulted on a, a mortgage payment last year and, and you would uh, quite factfully uh, enumerate all of the reasons why I couldn't get credit. That's and, right. And that, that makes it quite a transparent process and it would would give me trust in the process. But it also complies that I'm, I'm fairly sure in banking, they don't really use machine learning for uh, credit and, and risk type applications. I think the distinction is made in the book. So interpretable models versus model agnostic interpretations. So there's where the one case you can look into the black box and see the parameters like you're talking about there. Like there's the decision tree and in that sense, it's intrinsically interpretable because I can look at that versus looking at it as a black box and doing things like trying to come up with prototypes or whatever the modern terminology for all that is, uh, Lime or representative members, et cetera. Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, that's certainly true. So something like a, a logistic regression or a generalized linear model, that would be, I suppose you could call it a white box method. So you're just analyzing the, the model on its own. And then there are surrogate methods like Lime, for example, which are a complete black box methods. Lime is a local model agnostic method. So it means that you perturb, let's say it's a, a vision classifier. You can take a single input image and you can perturb it in lots of semantically relevant ways. And you're trying to flip the switch on the classifier. Right. Um, or I think the example that was funny in this book as spam filtering, where if you see a, a message that says, for great Christmas deals, come visit my site, uh, smiley face emoticon, then that 99% chance that spam. And then what Lime did was go in and just try all possible combinations of those words or combinations of the words taking out one word here or there the power set essentially but ordered set of those words You're like christmas deal visit no not that <laughs> one christmas deal visit site yes that's spam that sort of thing yeah but, but it, it's really interesting because um the reason why something like lime works so well is these models because lime what it essentially does is create a kind of linear model over the perturbations of a, a single input and globally the model is very non-linear so it's not you can't really explain it in a linear sense but on a local method when you're just taking a, a single input example it does actually become quite linear the activations in the neural network are, are surprisingly linear so in the case of an input image for example you, you what it does first is it segments the image and then it creates re regions and it mm -hmm. will just randomly mask off some of those regions so just make them gray well, and then yeah yeah, again, so you said there Lime works really well. I'm not sure it does. And that's what I love about no, this book. No, I'm not book, sure it does either. <laughs> is he's very clear about the the disadvantages and you know what you're just talking about there. You can imagine segmenting off portions of the image and masking them out or maybe uh, perturbing the pixels. There's such a huge exponential land of, of choices in there of how you're going to to do that that uh, augmentation or modification of the data set. Right? And that, that he lists is in his mind what the biggest disadvantage of this procedure is. And it comes back to the initial point, which is, boy, we're putting an awful lot of effort into mathematically modeling mathematical models. And I'm just kind of wondering if in a sense, we're chasing our tails here a little bit. Maybe we should focus more on intrinsically interpretable models. But there is a fundamental trade-off because we've all signed on to machine learning in the sense that the predictive accuracy is significantly better when we lose touch of the explainability or the, the verbalization capability of the model. So this is where I'm going to challenge and get on my, my normal soapbox. So you made the comment earlier that, uh, of course, more complex models predict better. But the complexity or adding more parameters or whatever isn't the only way to get better prediction and better accuracy. So back to my canonical parabola case, right? Sure, we can fit a parabola with infinitely many ReLUs, rectified linear units. And each one of those has, I don't depends on how you frame it, but say one to three parameters or something like that. You cut off a slope, whatever, scaling. Whereas if I'm somebody who just knows X squared, I can fit it with just a single X squared unit that has, again, some number of parameters, let's say three parameters. I don't think that's a, that's not a case of knowing more. It's a case of knowing different. 
And yeah. and Yannick brought up the point. Yeah, but if x squared, what about x cubed? And you to x to the tenth. Now what? So again, a human being can know something different there, which is x to the y, and now y is a parameter. So I think the key here is that we can improve these models by bringing in different, not more, which is that we bring in different types of structuring. If you look, for example, at, uh, let's say, uh, what's it called in neural networks where you find the uh, feature visualization, right? So you, you uh, I don't know, you find the hot dog or something like that, that, that gets recognized and you look at the, the neurons that light up and you create op images to optimize those activation of those neurons. And you wind up with kind of these eigenfaces, if you will, the images that represent that particular feature. And if you look through those on neural networks, you'll find a lot of those are a feature, let's say a hot dog. Yeah, there we go. That, perfect. So let's find one that's, I want to find one that's distinguishing something interesting like wheels or, so, so he's got an example in the book actually of this. Let's, if we go to, let's take a look at, if you go to 7.1, yeah, there we go. If we go to figure 7.3 in his book, there we go. So let's look at that one right there. So this is the activation that has a high positive value for wheel versus uh, a high negative value for wheels. And you can see there, what have we got? We've actually got wheels on the left that are translated and scaled a bit. So there's a big wheel in the lower left there, and then it's it's got almost three copies of itself that are downscaled a bit and translated to different sections of the image. And so you can see that neural networks are really straining to do affine transformations <laughs> yeah th th this is absolutely true i think this is actually coming from the article i was just showing you so let's just do a quick oh, intro okay. on that so uh th this guy chris ola uh, he's an amazing guy and he's, he wrote this distill article about feature visualization and just to quickly describe how this works so yannick has obviously made a video on this he's made a video on everything but the idea <laughs> is that you can Light solve speed. an op he is, he is light speed culture. You can solve an optimization problem to create an input image that maximally activates an output class or a neuron inside your neural network or even an entire layer inside your neural network. And when you look at what the optimal image is that maximally activates that layer or neuron or output class, you can then see the kind of patterns or features that part of the neural network is learning. And as you can see, when you look at edges early on in the neural network, it tends to be learning patterns. And these look a bit like Gabor filters, which are the kind of things that computer vision engineers used to create deliberately in, in early vision applications. Slightly later on, on, I mean, this is, I think, around the third layer, it seems to be learning textures and then patterns and then parts and then objects as we go deeper in the neural network. There is a web page actually, which uh, allows you to click through this visualize for all of the ResNet layers in, in an ImageNet classifier. I'll find that in a second, but, and, and you can see here, so you, you can either do it on a neuron basis, on an entire channel, on a layer. This is what Deep Dream is, if you remember Deep Dream. So that was optimizing across an entire layer uh, on the output class logits or the, the class probabilities. So you get some really interesting uh, results there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and obviously but, yeah. With, with CNNs, so CNNs, just by the way in which they're structured, in a sense, they, they can handle translation okay. Scaling is more difficult for them. The higher up you go in the layers, it becomes more difficult to learn objects scaled to different sizes. But what I'm saying here is if we found a way to, I don't know, let's say take neural networks and double the number of parameters but have them understand affine invariance or triple the number of parameters and have them understand affine invariance. That would be a huge win. So it's not the case, in my opinion, it's not a case of learning more because a, a neural network that understands affine invariance with a thousand nodes would, in my opinion, completely outperform a neural network with a thousand nodes that didn't understand Affine, and I, I should have said parameters, thousand parameters versus parameter. So parameter per parameter, if we understood things like affine invariance, just like if we understood things like multiplication or X to a power, it's not more, it's different. 
let's go through the, the thought process because you started off by saying imagine we had a parabola it wouldn't yeah. make sense to fit it with lots of uh, relu units we we would take a parabola and similarly if we had a fairly simple predictive problem if it was a regression problem uh, on a low dimensional data set we could visualize the correlation and, and it might just be something we could fit manually and, and this is what data scientists used to do they might just yep. fit some polynomial to it and sure uh, we're using the right tools for the job but now we fast forward into the unstructured computer vision world and the reason why CNNs work so well is is they learn features as part of the training process, which are better than any handcrafted features. Because I think what you're saying is, why don't we shortcut this process and do what computer vision engineers used to do? And that was to handcraft features for a particular domain. And that's something which has always failed before. But I agree with you that when you take the example of that bicycle wheel, we were looking at that bicycle wheel and it, this, let's look at this again. This is crazy, right? Because this looks like a total failure. This looks like it's just a warped bicycle wheel that, and it's been statistically warped such that it will match as many wheels in the training set as possible under different conditions. And clearly, if we were building a wheel matcher, probably, by the way, this isn't just matching wheels, it's matching other things as well, but mostly wheels, we would be able to come up with many more affine transformations of wheels than this. This is all that yeah. the networks come up with. Yeah, exactly. And first of all, I don't think image recognition works that well. Always come back to this adversarial image generation, right? That's just an abject total failure of image recognition. Okay, if I can go around town and put a little sticker on stop signs in 20 years that suddenly calls, causes all the self-driving vehicles to go absolute mayhem and crash into each other, that's an absolute abject failure of, of image recognition. So it works only in the sort of toy, oh, look at our ResNet or uh, ImageNet archive and whatever. And sure, it works well in there. But look, as a practitioner, I've been out there like trying to apply image recognition and, and setting up a demo, for example, and, and having somebody walk by who, because of their features, was recognized as a garbage truck not very good to have that happen like when you're giving a demo so i just i don't think it's working well i think it's working very poorly and i think part of the reason why it works so poorly is that we haven't taught it some of the basics about reality scaling rotation etc and you brought up the case with sort of the my little toy example of the the parabola there if i was coding and back when i was doing this kind of thing i would actually just put into the feature set different powers of the input variables, right? So X squared, X cubed. And I would never really go, oftentimes I wouldn't go much above X cubed because in the scenarios I was working, I knew as an engineer that most systems in the real world that I was working with, all the interesting kind of stuff happened within powers zero to three, maybe with some halves in there. So I might do 2.5, 3.5, 1.5, right? but it wasn't like I just added thousands of powers, like all powers from X from zero to 1000, or I might put in one that was a free parameter Y. And then of course, well, I've now added a new parameter. So I need to penalize that parameter, have some information criteria or, or whatever. So I think I'm just saying, we got to teach neural networks to understand some really basics, basic features of the three dimensional world in which we live. And I think they'll perform so much better. Again, just to gently challenge you on that. So I, I know we've been talking a lot about compositional pattern producing networks because we, we've been talking about open endedness and pick breeder and we'll come back and talk about that on, an, on another day. But there are things online that allow you to visualize the results of a compositional pattern producing network. And this is a really simple neural network that takes in takes in an X and a Y and it produces um, uh, a few color channels, essentially. So it's learning to mutate a very basic neural network as a function of its parents. So you can kind of like, I quite like things that look like that, that and that. Let's mutate. And you see what I'm doing? And this is what neural networks do. They can learn pretty much any function. And, and you said yourself that just given a few powers, well, it's the same thing in neural networks, given a few different activation functions and different interactions between neurons, you can do some really crazy stuff. You seem to be making the argument that this is not fit for purpose. No, I'm just saying we're not devoting nearly enough time into researching activation functions and nonlinear so everybody's putting so much effort into just how can I structure my layers differently? 
I'm going to rev revolutionize neural networks by putting some cool layer in between these other two layers that were already there. And now it's got a new name. It's Network 59 instead of whatever it was before. And this is just awesome. All the efforts going into that kind of thing, like tweaking layers and connectivity and not much work into the actual activation functions. Like it's like we just have sort of the same pool of the usual suspects, sigmoid, relu, whatever. And also not a lot of work is being put into how can I create a layer somehow with connections and activation functions that's rotationally invariant? Or maybe it's just rotationally invariant for every five degree increment or something like that. I'm just saying I'm not seeing right. a lot of effort into those pathways. Is that, am I missing but, it? Even on this NEAT thing, so this thing I just showed you, the CPPN, it, it's built on NEAT, which is an, ev an evolutionary algorithm uh, for finding uh, neural network topologies. And it will essentially uh, compose together any number of activation functions. So you can have all the trigonometric functions, you can have all the, the powers of X and so on. Um, so it, w within reason, it would be able to fit almost anything. Because, because I think you're arguing the toss over, should we evolve or learn some kind of neural network structure versus should we a priori capture the structure about reality as we know it? And should the layer structures, should we just trying to be, should we be aiming to be clever in ways like, yeah, I'm going to have this structure feed forward into some other things because then it should be more parsimonious or, or whatnot, or it'll be able to get a longer range. Or should we really be putting in effort into like I'm saying, creating layers that understand the basics of 3D physics. So how do I create, like, has anyone shown a structuring of layers that produces a rotationally invariant neural network? Yes. They have. Okay. Yeah. Affine yeah, so invariant? I, I, what about affine invariants? I, I don't know about affine, but um, I did a, a video with Ilya Karmanov earlier this year, and it was called uh, CNN Symmetries. And there are people, so um, there, there are a couple of researchers called Cohen and Wellen, and they are producing neural network architectures that provide various different types of invariants to things like rotation and scale and so on. Okay, good. So the rotation so one, what they did, the, the first version would take the CNN filter and it would rotate it 90 degrees four times. So essentially... Because the problem is with these CNNs, we're wasting the representational capacity, right? Because if you, you rotate something by five degrees and the neural network won't recognize it, the kind of cheating way of getting rotational equivariance is by creating copies of the CNN and rotating it so that the rotated one would activate if the image was rotated. But then there was a more sophisticated version using circular harmonics. Oh, um, right. So I remember, I remember reading that paper actually a little bit. Um, and I, I can't remember what I found in there that was kind of like, yeah, it's a step in the right direction, but it's not there yet, like the circular harmonics paper. So great. Those are great initial steps. What I'm saying is there's not nearly enough effort along those lines, in my opinion. I think if we were funneling a lot of the effort that we're putting into just building yet larger neural networks with more compute nodes and fancy kind of like arbitrary layer constructions, if we actually funneled it into this type of work, right? how to create layers that are rotation and not by doing it through data augmentation. So fine. Yeah. I'll just take my image and rotate it by <laughs> 90 degrees and stick all that data into an augmented data set. And then lo and yep. behold, it will learn those. No, I'm saying structure layers that just already have rotational invariance built in and yeah and much this more is efficiently. the it's the fundamental dichotomy between priors and experience so at the moment we are completely biased towards experience we have neural networks which are almost blank slates and they know almost nothing about the world that we with that we live in and even data augmentation is just another form of experience so we're, we're creating semantically equivalent transformations and then we're feeding them back into the blank slate model but. Yeah, and I'll have to I'll have to read those papers again because I, I think what I remember is that the spherical harmonics were computed at a very early layer. Like it was, we've got a uh, whatever four five by five grid, and we calculate some function there that's rotationally invariant. But then see, it's not going to be able to learn rotational invariance 
at higher levels of the layer. So I've got to do my homework. I don't recall. So up until now, and I will look into those papers, I just don't recall any anything that says, here's this clever layer structure that's very close to being rotationally invariant, period, at kind of all scales, something like that. Yeah, because one of the trade-offs here is the sample efficiency problem. Because if we did have a neural network that contained all of the priors about the world we lived in, then we would only need to give it one example. As you said, it would recognize the hot dog uh, from all angles. At the moment, it's a blank slate, which means we need to give it loads of semantically equivalent views of the hot dog for it right. to recognize the hot dog. And the thing is as well, it's it's not just rotation invariance and scale invariance. It, it's also the manifold that the world lives on. So for right. example, if I took a picture of a tree that we're, we're putting it into a CNN that models everything on a planar manifold. It just sees pixels on a planar manifold. And a tree in the real world actually has a three-dimensional structure. And the way it reflects light and interacts with the world around it, wouldn't it be good if the model had some concept of a cylindrical manifold to model that tree? That's what we do. We know that if someone throws a ball at the tree, it's a cylindrical manifold and the ball will reflect off in some direction. Mm -hmm. So part of this maybe is we need to build a physical model of the environment that we're in as well. A lot of that agree with you, which is that no doubt adding some type of physics modeling beyond just some of the basic ones we've been talking about, Newton's laws or things like that can be very helpful. And then in addition, and I haven't looked at the research in this in, in quite a while, but obviously binocular vision is uh, an important part of how humans do that, right? Because we're able to construct this 3D representation in our mind. And the cool thing with some potential future of neural networks is that they can go far beyond that, right? With the self-driving cars, it's not binocular vision. It's you know, however many cameras you install and, and panoramic, or and there's some laser telemetry in there as well. So they have the potential to be, uh, what's the word for that? Like multi what is it? Multi-something telemetry. I forget what people call that. You know, anyway, you have telemetry from many different sources, right? Coming back to, because you were raising the question of this, this motorcycle wheel. And it's really funny because when you look at this wheel, it makes you realize just how crazy this whole thing is. Because that motorcycle wheel is the principal piece of knowledge that neural network has acquired about motorcycle wheels. It's actually slightly topological because it's not a motorcycle anymore, it's a motorcycle wheel. Motorcycles mm -hmm. have wheels. Maybe that means that the wheel is the most instructive thing about a motorcycle, and maybe it also means that it's a shared concept with other semantic objects that right. we want to learn. But what it's done is it's taken the real world, given loads of experience, and it's composed it into a hierarchy of shapes and textures and concepts and so on. And when you look at one of those uh, things that it's, that it's learned, it makes you think, wow, that's actually quite one-dimensional. And I want to sketch out, I was reading this article by this chap yesterday, I, I did send it over to you, and he's making the same argument about language models. Now, uh, I just discovered this guy, he's a pretty interesting guy, Walid Sabah, and he's saying the tech giants are completely wasting time, we're barking up the wrong tree, and uh, clearly he's... A, so far, no. Yeah, I, I could tell that he's one of these guys from the, from the kind of Marvin Minsky generation from the 1980s, and ontologies, and logical reasoning, and so on. Could, because that conception of AI was uh, modeling everything as uh, logical over um, symbols, basically. Yeah, expert systems type thing. It, exactly, exactly. And But I, I love this as a critique of the current machine learning movement, because he's basically saying that what we're doing is we're just throwing loads and loads of uh, data from the internet into these language models, and it's it appears that they're producing something coherent, but he gives a couple of examples here of just how completely crazy they are. So there's a premise and a hypothesis all of my friends are married. The hypothesis is I have a friend who's not a bachelor. Okay, so clearly the uh, the hypothesis follows from, from the premise. And this is how you would construct it logically. And what he's suggesting here is that in our brains, we actually create a bunch of symbols and logical reasoning over those symbols. And that's what we would expect a machine learning model to do. So just reading this out, now everyone would agree that the hypothesis should follow from the premise. If all of my friends are married, then of course I have a friend who is married. So we should get this result because of that logical reasoning. Thus, if all my friends are married, premise, then I have a friend who is married, hypothesis must follow. But this is what you get. So when you stick that 
into some of these NLP models, it says that the entailment is 31.3%. And entailment means are they semantically equivalent? So the models are failing. It says that there's a 20.5% chance of contradiction and a 48.2% chance of uh, it being neutral. Okay. So he said, the reason I want to show this example is to highlight that entailment, which is the most basic textual relationship, cannot be done by systems that do not allow for symbolic reasoning. If you try an, uh, an example involving a slightly more intricate relationship, then you start getting ridiculous results. So here we go. Premise, a house is bigger than a chair. Hypothesis, chairs fit inside a house, right? Mm-hmm. And, and here, when you stick that through one of these language models, it says the entailment is 4.3%. So this is just completely crazy. It, it even says that it's a contradiction. So it's so easy to trip up these statistical language models. And I would argue that this is analogous to that bicycle wheel. Right. Because all it's learned is a bunch of statistical patterns between words based on a corpus of text that we've given it. And, the, and, and, and what, what you're saying is let's have a 3D model and let's create an environment where it's should we call that spatial reasoning? Because this is logical reasoning for language. Yeah, I, th- I think that's fair. Yeah, spatial yeah. reasoning. Yeah. So there's definitely a relationship there because I guess in the context of of the article you were just showing, Saba's article, I haven't read it, but it sounds like what he's saying is that we need to teach these NLP systems first order logic at the very least. And that if they don't have that understanding of first order logic built in, that they get into all these sorts of silly situations. And I think it, it is analogous to the image recognition scenario where if we don't build in the basic spatial logic of kind of the en- environment or the world in general, then they get into situations where they start doing silly things because they've had to use up and they do things that violate that spatial logic because they've had to use up all their free degrees of freedom to learn lots of basics that we could have taught them yeah. structurally. And so that's That's why you end up with all these sort of adversarial, like that's the way in which that is demonstrated in in images, because for image recognition, pretty much the outcome is a classification thing, typically. What is this image? And those adversarial examples serve as that use case. Exactly, because because people often um, ask the question, what do we mean when we say that humans can reason? And it's about being able to take lots of disparate knowledge and creating logical rules that generalize in all situations. So reasoning is a very powerful thing. And when you look at that bicycle wheel, it's so obvious that what it's done is it's learned a statistical pattern that works in a lot of situations, but clearly it's rubbish. Whereas when you have a logical um, uh, proposition which says that, what was that house example? Yeah, um, a chair is smaller than a house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a chair's fit in a house. That's just a piece of, it's a fact. It's a piece of knowledge that will generalize to, every single chair will fit into every single house pretty much on this planet. That's a really useful piece of knowledge. But the, the problem is people have been trying to create knowledge graphs for 30 years and they are brittle, they are expensive to create, they don't generalize very well. So what we really want is to have some kind of an AI algorithm that will create the knowledge graph for us, but possibly a balance. We want to seed it. We want to create some core knowledge. Of right, exactly. And we also want to learn more knowledge from a few examples. So that's what I completely agree with, which is that, and I obviously have some homework to do on what the state of the art is for things like transformationally invariant neural networks and and whatnot. But those paths are the paths I think we need to put more effort into, which is let's get this core knowledge, right? The basic facts about the structure of the world, get some of that encoded. I'm not saying to encode all of it. Absolutely not. I'm just saying, Let's get a lot of the basics encoded. So for example, back when I was trying to do engineering, machine learning and engineering contexts, I just knew from having studied many papers and general kind of knowledge that, like I said, powers up to cubed are probably enough and and, and then half powers in there. And I did pretty well with just those kind of uh, half dozen or so powers. I didn't need to encode every single conceivable nonlinear relationship in every single white paper out there. So let's just get some of the basic core knowledge really built into 
our machine learning systems and then see what they can add on top of that because I think it would be fascinating. It's what would the, if that image recognition that found the bicycle wheel, if it understood affine invariance, so it could just do scaling, rotation, translation. We don't even, not even did it, we want to make it understand uh, rotation in three dimensions, which would cause it to, but let's say it did. Okay. What would it find? I bet it would find a lot of pretty cool stuff that I'd like to see rather than just, oh yeah, it's moved this around to four different locations and or rotated it by 90 degrees. Like I want to see what it can find on top of some basic stuff that, that we already know through and through by the time we're a young child. I know it's so difficult, isn't it? Because there's also recognition versus representation. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't because know how much neural networks, that's an interesting, how much do we believe neural networks represent versus recognize? So you take that, for example, that wheel again. Obviously, there's some combination of weights and connections in there that, in a sense, you could say represent a wheel. In fact, that that neuron itself, whatever, if it lights up, then that's the representation of a wheel. And then at some higher layers, that representation can be reasoned about, like in the very simple sense in which neural networks reason by activation functions and combining those. Because to come back to the compression thing we spoke about last week, one thing neural networks are very good at is that network is just a hierarchy of representations. And many of those representations are shared, particularly in the lower levels. Entangled, and yeah. Exactly. What if you did explicitly and exhaustively describe everything in our world? Would that just be intractable? Well... <laughs> who knows i mean I, I i guess for me it's for me it seems intractable and and i'm not sure it's kind of the way to go because i think as yannick pointed out in our previous video whenever we do encode knowledge we do have to do so like very carefully to always leave an out for the algorithm to deny that knowledge so if we encode that the sky is up that's a problem we need to really encode is that in some direction there might be a sky and and then actually would think about it and who knows actually there could be multiple there could be more than one sky in different directions the zero one zero one or n rule of computer science there's either nothing of something one of something or an arbitrarily large number of them and we have to consider that and so we have to encode knowledge in ways that provide these outs so that whatever knowledge they develop can be generalized beyond just the limited context in which they're trained. Because we, we do have this concept that intelligence is somehow the ability to step outside of the familiar domain that you've been operating in and at least have a chance of not getting destroyed, <laughs> having yeah. a chance of surviving outside of that domain. Yeah, exactly. And it does make me think that to what extent could that knowledge be explicitly programmed for every situation? I don't think it could, because a lot of intelligence is about being able to adapt to new situations and take existing knowledge and existing facts and reasoning over them in a new way. Yeah, this, it always it makes me think of uh, what is it the uh, who was it that wrote the unreasonable effectiveness of of mathematics and and science? This is kind of I, I can't believe I'm blanking on the author, but uh, this is a, a very fascinating. Let's see, unreasonable. I know there have been many papers starting with the unreasonable effect of, so it must be. Uh, yeah, but this is the uh, the, the original. I, I'm, uh, Wigner, Eugene Eugene Wigner. Wigner. Yeah, yeah, back in the '60s, and this has been thought about a lot um, since then, maybe before. But isn't it bizarre that these sort of simple, and I'm not saying simple is easy, by the way. That simple and easy are very different concepts for those out there. I've got a whole soapbox on that issue we can talk about one day. But these very simple symbolic equations that we develop, dx squared, dt squared, you know, sort of thing, they work so well for nature. And isn't that a bizarre kind of scenario? And so I don't what think we, it is bizarre. 
I find it bizarre personally. And I know a lot of, or I found it quite mystifying, I should say. And a lot of folks have as well. And it leads one to think maybe the entire universe is a mathematical structure or, or things like that. Uh, but let's not digress on that just now. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, if you sure. don't mind, because what I wanted to say was just an answer to your question is that we've got to just find, I think the, again, the, the core knowledge is a good name for it. It's the relatively small subset of core things that we as a, as a species have learned over the last 10,000 plus years of modern or, or semi-modern thought and encode that and then just see where we can get to. That's all. Like these attempts to encode rotational invariance and things like that. Let's just go a little bit down that path, focus some of our resources there, get some nice layer structures and activation functions and whatnot that encode those simple things very robustly. But what if it was not possible to encode it? So so again, we're, we're, we're going full circle, but the reason why CNNs, for example, work so well is no human could handcraft those features. Now, I understand what you're saying. You're saying, why don't we create some digital twin is is a horrible uh, term, but some kind of physical simulation and some way of representing knowledge and being able to spatially reason over it. Uh, We could do that exhaustively. I'm not even sure that's possible. Well, I'm going to disagree with you again. I don't don't think CNNs work that well. So I think uh, the, the reason humans don't craft those wacky features is because they don't work well in in the physical world and so we didn't really need them maybe there were some early species that uh, that uh, found mungy ways of recognizing wheels and they all died off so they're no longer around so i don't think cnns work well let me sketch it another way let's imagine that it is possible to exhaustively describe the world that we live in but I think it might be computationally intractable. So let's say that we we build a system to recognize any type of object and any type of scene as given to us on a 2D plane, so an image. Okay. And l- let's imagine that you took that hot dog and you did every single affine transformation. You tried to fit it to every single part of the image and okay. you found a match in the bottom left of the image. It would just be intractable to do that, wouldn't it? So I uh, we have brains that do it. So there's at least that one example of a type of computational device, some hybrid of analog digital computation that is able to perform it. Now, depending on kind of which side of the camp you're on, although the the human brain's terrible compared to neural networks, when you you should think, great, then we've got a good shot at, at doing better than the human brain does in a computationally tractable way, okay? Or maybe you're in my camp that says, look, the the human brain is far underestimated in terms of its the number of its equivalents, let's say, in terms of how big of a neural network and how much CPU you would need to implement it. But I think it's not intractable. We can get there, I think. And maybe with some clever some clever work in structuring of layers, activation functions, et cetera, to get them to understand, not exhaustively, but just the basic core knowledge of highly effective mathematical uh, and logical reasoning. I think we can get there. I don't think it's intractable. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I'm not somebody that thinks the singularity is 20 years away and I need to download my mind now or just give up and and be happy until then. It, it's probably a, a ways off, maybe 100 years or, or something like that. But I think we can. I think we can get there eventually. Yeah, because th- the challenge seems to be going from a scene or a body of text into some kind of representation and it might be a physical simulation or it might be a bunch of uh, symbols and their relationship to each other and so on because once we have that then we can do almost anything it the problem is though there are many relationships in in language that are just they, they can't be explicitly described they are statistical they're context dependent and so on um so well context uh, context dependence can be described we've had context sensitive grammars around for a long time they're just they're computationally much more difficult than context free grammars um, and, and and we do always run into this problem of computational difficulties uh, for example being able to compute marginals right integrals over more than one dimension for that matter once you get into more than one dimension it just becomes way more difficult right? and when we're talking yeah. about problems that have n dimensions calculating those marginals is extremely challenging 
And of course, we have approximate yeah. techniques and whatever, Markov chain, Monte Carlo or, or whatnot. But still, at the end of the day, we just don't have the computational resources to do what the mathematics is telling us we should be doing if we actually wanted the answer. Exactly. And that's a great example that there was um, a bunch of people from FAIR that used a language model for figuring out how to do integration. And it's a bit like the black art of the maths world. There are so many different ways of doing it. And funnily enough, a, a kind of statistical pattern recognition type system using a, a transformers model work quite well a lot of the time. Oh, that's an interesting paper. So uh, Guillaume Lampert, we, we interviewed him a few weeks ago and uh, he used a, a transformers model to describe the, the formula just in language. And then he could just through continuation, I think, predict the the result of that integration problem. Wow, so it, crazy. Because it, it, that's the amazing thing about language is you can describe anything in language. So if, if you come up with a way of um, describing a mathematical formula, you can describe that in language and then you can get a transformer model to solve it because you can train it on loads of completions, loads of examples of uh, solutions that are known. And then sure. it will learn interesting patterns in those completions. And they've even used it for uh, theorem uh, proving. So, but was this symbolic integration or numerical? Like what? Symbolic. Okay. So I'm saying computationally, if you want to do integrals that don't have symbolic solutions and you're trying to do them computationally, so the marginalizing probability distributions that comes up often, just use, just trying to do those numerical integrals is just computationally yeah. you know, not feasible. And so we have to find kind of shortcut methods. So I'm not trying to underplay the difficulty in, in computation at all. It's a, it's definitely a significant problem that, that we face now, always have faced, probably will face for a very long time to come. I just this would like to it. see a lot more work along the lines of the, for example, the rotational symmetry that we talked about earlier, things like that. I'd like to see a lot more investment in trying to encode this core knowledge robustly into our machine learning structures. Yeah, I think it'd be fruitful. Easier said than done, eh? <laughs> so Gary Marcus is the guy, he's probably the biggest critic of deep learning right now. He's uh, cl clearly in the symbolic camp. And this image, <laughs> it looks scary, but it does actually have some rhyme and reason to it, which we'll see in a minute. But yeah, he basically says that uh, he's really pissed off about the Guardian review of GPT-3 because you know, they generated an article of GPT-3, but it turned out that they had an editorial license and they generated several versions of it and they edited it together. Uh, they cheated yeah, so I, on, hey, on the hype train. As a funny story, I did that. So some years ago, I used to be involved in various flame wars on Usenet and whatnot. And there was one guy in particular that I just, he, he was just off his rocker and easily triggered by certain technological claims and whatnot. So I took a whole bunch of his posts and used them to, and I wrote my little, very easy uh, Markov chain sort of generator that would try to create text that was you know similar to his. I took a bunch of his posts, used that as the, the training for that, generated a bunch of random text, and then did this editorial license, took out segments and pasted them together. I didn't change any of the wording. I just would take out different paragraphs and sentences and thing and, and paste them together. And I got the guy to argue with that that Monte Carlo generator for three back and forth until he started oh, to suspect brilliant. like something was up. <laughs> and, it, and it was just kind of this coup de grace in the, in the news group there, like people showing how this guy was just on autopilot like arguing yeah. with, with stuff that was totally nonsensical. Yeah, I wonder what his uh, generative model looked like. Probably not much more complicated than yours. But uh, yeah. So I no, mean, I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in, in, in the papers about GPT-3 and, and the criticism uh, that he's waging. So he, yeah. definitely he's on my list of, of videos to watch. Okay, on this article, he said that OpenAI have not responded to his requests for research access. So Ooh. OpenAI have been incredibly selective on who they give access to the API and, and uh, clearly they, that, they didn't give access to Gary. That's not very scientific, is it? I no, mean, that's, well, kinda, that's, ant that's antithetical to what we're supposed to be doing. It, exactly. So his, his um, thesis here is that it's all about the hype train and um, open AI are interested in commercializing it and building the hype up as much as possible. They're not seriously interested in people criticizing it. 
and, right. and he wrote a, an earlier criticism of GPT two as well. But it, it, well, it, it also said that. Um, Open AI has thus far not allowed us to have access, despite both the company's name and the non-profit status of the oversight organization. So Open AI wow. is clearly... Wow. So, yeah, well, just, um, just like we said, good explanations are consistent with prior beliefs of the explainee. So Open AI does <laughs> not want any criticism or, you know, it has to be consistent with their prior beliefs. And clearly yeah. they know Gary is not consistent with their prior beliefs and therefore they're going to ignore him. It, exactly. It, it does make you wonder, but it says it seems to be a serious breach of scientific, um, it is. Uh, scientific eth ethics. Yeah. I believe so. so. But uh, they, they did uh, test a few things here, which I think really highlight the limitations of GPT-3. So one is biological reasoning. And so GPT-3 can just complete anything you give it. So here they said, you poured yourself a glass of cranberry juice, but then you absentmindedly poured about a teaspoon of grape juice into it. It looks okay. You tried sniffing it, but you had a bad cold, so you can't smell anything. You're very thirsty, and it completes it. You drink it. You are now dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, it seems to assume that uh, grapefruit uh, juice is a poison, despite the fact that there are many references on the web to cranberry grape recipes that uh, it's a commercial drink i so. bet you what it's actually doing there and i don't know how much has been done on the explainability of gpt3 but if you go back to that paragraph and if, if you're thinking more locally and you just look at the two sentences that came before the final sentence right you try sniffing it you have a cold you can't smell anything you're very thirsty so you drink it that's you know there's probably some crime novels out there that that have that same combination of of sentences in there, right? Oh, definitely. Well, this is exactly the same. Remember that bicycle wheel. Um, it's locality. It, it's always locality. It is neural networks get sucked into local, should we say reasoning or whatever, local inference, and it trips them up. Yeah, exactly. But this pattern of text probably corresponds to, of course, we saw a bicycle wheel earlier, but it would be something else in the language world. It would be some kind of pattern which is being used as an anchor for represent for representing lots of similar concepts. It's almost like a, a junction in a highway or something. And that's where it's going back to. Physical reasoning. You're having a small dinner party. You want to serve dinner in the living room. The dining room table is wider than the doorway. So to get into the living room, you now have to remove the door. <laughs> you have a table saw, so you cut the door in half and remove the top half. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> yeah, okay. so this is one confusion after another. The natural solution here would be to either tip the table on its side or to take the legs off the table uh, if they're detachable. Removing a door is sometimes necessary to widen a doorway, but much more rarely it wouldn't have been worthwhile for a dinner party. So all of it, it comes back to our core knowledge thing, right? And these are just basic things about our physical reality that if GPT-3 knew about that, it would be able to, we said last week, you've got this generative model, but you need to constrain and reason over the information coming out. Right. It's clearly not doing that. So um, we'll do another one. Social reasoning. You are a defense lawyer. You have to go to court today. Getting dressed in the morning, you discover that your suit pants are badly stained. However, your bathing suit is clean and very stylish. In fact, it's expensive French couture. It was a birthday present from Isabel. You decide that you should do them. Wear the bathing suit to court. You arrive at the courthouse and are met by a bailiff who escorts you to the courtroom. So it doesn't know that bathing suits are not appropriate attire for a court. Right. right. Yeah, and it, it doesn't know that you probably have other clothing besides just the suit pants. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. So object and individual tracking. Yesterday, I dropped my clothes off at the dry cleaners and have yet to pick them up. Where are my clothes? And then it says, I have a lot of clothes. So it's evading well, there the it knows. There it knows you apparently have more than just the clothes that were at the dry cleaner. <laughs> yes, it does. Psychological reasoning, what's that? Janet and Penny went to the store to get presents for Jack. Janet said, I want to buy Jack a top. Don't get Jack, Jack a top, says Penny. He has a top. He will da -da -dun, get a top. I'll get Jack a top, says Janet. And of course, what it should have said is uh, he'll make you take it back. So it's not really reasoning over the information. But it, it does go to show, though, that of course it's not reasoning, right? It's just a bloody hash table. How could it yeah. possibly be reasoning over that information? Because if you think about it, like the forward pass 
um, through one of these language models? How could it possibly be reasoning? Well, that's kind of a philosophical question, right? If it was simply a memorization hash machine, and if you look at how it works in terms of a forward pass, that's what it's doing. It, it's going, remember that bicycle wheel, it's basically finding the bicycle wheel and, and retrieving it. That's all it's doing. If it was trained on every possible branch structure of this conversation, maybe there would be a bicycle wheel for when Janet didn't buy Jack the top. So it would right. go and get that bicycle wheel. Yeah. And on the one hand, I'm, I'm tempted to say, obviously, it's not reasoning, but we have to be a little bit careful. It's like in our last conversation where I was talking about alpha zero. I, I think some people would certainly say that if you have a, a program that has whatever, a bunch of heuristics, doesn't matter whether they're, they come up with them by reinforcement learning or human encoded, it doesn't make a difference. But And it gets a position that it's never seen before and it's doing computation and evaluating moves and chooses the right one. A lot of people would concede that as reasoning. And, and I think you could even formalize it to say that it is reasoning, say, in the sense of an expert system. Like it, it's uh, taking the data, it's taking prior statements, facts, knowledge, um, it's deducing, inferring, et cetera. It's coming up with what it thinks is the right move. Now, imagine that, that instead of that, you had a, a black box that some highly advanced civilization came and dropped off that literally was just a circuit that actually solved the piece based complete problem of chess. So it's just, you gave it a position and it just was just a, a static circuit that evaluated it and gave you the exact move that was the, the one to play in that position. Is that reasoning? It's kind of like if I have a, if I have say an early, uh, adder in a, in a computer, like an ad, an ad circuit that, that yeah. has to do so in more than one step. Uh, you know, it, it takes several cycles to add, or maybe multiplication is a better example. Multiplication, it takes, let's say you've got a circuit that takes multiple cycles, right? We can say that that's computing, right? It is computing. On the other hand, what if I just have a multiplication circuit that's just a fully splayed out, you know, uh, NAND tree that you that that you just put it in, and then the circuit in one cycle gives you gives you the answer? Is that computing? So there is this weird kind of thing where we think that static static evaluations are somehow fundamentally different than dynamic ones that take course over time. And I think that's a bit of an illusion. I think they are the same, but everything you can do in a programming language, it's not just conditional logic, it's also looping semantics and so on. Because in that chess example, if the circuit could follow some conditional logic it can say i'm in this kind of situation i have these threats i need to go and identify all of the possible attack vectors i need to sure. assign a probability or score to them i need to loop through them i then need to take the, the the best action which is blah 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 if i could do that then that is reasoning yeah but so the point i was making like with the multiplication circuit is that any type of looping logic like that if you have enough circuits can actually be unrolled so you can just unroll it into just a single circuit that just calculates that in a single flow of electrons through it. Like there's there's no need for actually that temporal iteration. You can unroll yeah. all that and make it static. But that's what a neural network is. I agree with you, which is why I'm saying that I don't think it's fair to say a neural network isn't reasoning solely because it's a static mesh of activations. But this comes back to Cholet's conception of generalization, because Understood. if you unroll, then, yeah, it's reasoning, but only in that precise situation. But I'm saying there's an equivalence between a program and an unrolled version of the program. They're going to do the exact same. They're going to give the exact same result for every input. It's just one is a static circuit that does all its computation in kind of a gate gate flow of electrons in a sort of single pass versus having a state that evolves over time. But at the end of the day, it's the same calculation being performed. And we have this bit of a bias almost that if it takes you longer to do something and you have to do it in steps, that's reasoning. Where if you just had a bunch of electrical potentials that coalesced onto the answer, that's, that's not reasoning. But isn't the difference one is very memory intensive? So one is enumerating all of the possible paths. 
And oh, absolutely. Other... So that's what I said earlier about enough circuits. When he, anytime you start doing this unrolling, you start to dramatically expand the number. I think it's probably an exponential growth or something of mm -hmm. the size of the circuit, the number of the circuits. That's why we don't do that for, for all things. That's why we have programs and we have CPUs that are performing computation. It makes sense to unroll certain things as, as circuits like multiplication because it gets used all the time and we want it to take place in one cycle or whatever and that's great but i totally agree that and that's the point behind neural networks today and i think part of the folly behind them is they're just going to larger and larger unrolled loops if you will whereas what we really need yeah. to do as other authors have commented is add on top of that some type of computation, reasoning, circuitry, a hybrid between the two to get the most bang out of our, our circuitry, really. Yeah, I agree. But I'm just saying philosophically, like from a logical point of view, we shouldn't just necessarily say because something isn't doing time-based iterative computation that that's not reasoning. You know, whereas, so if, if I have two equivalent circuits and one does something by iterative computation and the other just has it all splayed out in a static circuit, they're the same to me. Like I don't see any difference in one being intelligent and, and one not. There is a difference because one can generalize analytically to a lot more situation. Can it? Oh, you mean one technique? Like in other words, the, the iterative sort of, those well, two circuits are completely equivalent. Let me give you an example. So the, the sorting algorithm. So mm -hmm. you could create a function that would, for every possible permutation of numbers, return yep. the sorting. Sorting algorithm is a, maybe it's a bad example, but you could write quick sort in about five lines of code, or you could just memorize every possible input. I understand the difference. And I totally agree that in terms of a certain number of resources, you can do much more with allowing time to play a role in, in doing iteration. Totally agree with that. So I'm just saying that if I have two circuits that are totally equivalent, you know, if I have one computer has a multiply circuit that does it in five cycles for a 32-bit integer, and the other does it in one cycle, they're equally intelligent to me. They're, they're, I can't say that the one that does it in one cycle is, is dumb, and the one that does it in five is smart, because for all inputs, they produce the same output. One is just a form of kind of compression that utilizes time. I, I don't know. I just don't, I think there's a bit of a pitfall here where if we just start drawing a distinction between uh, static computation versus uh, temporal computation, I'm not sure that's a valid distinction for all cases. It might depend what you optimize for as well, because we have FPGAs, for example, and they, they are used for high frequency trading and you can put neural networks on there. But the trade-off there, of course, is rigidity. So now yeah, um, that's right. they're very difficult to program and they're very difficult to, to operate and so on. I would totally agree, as we said earlier, that, and, and so I'm not advocating that we just go down this path of larger and larger neural networks. I think that's the complete opposite path to go down. I agree with you. We should be going down these temporal layers and computations, et cetera. I just want to be a bit careful about how we define what is and what isn't reasoning and just make sure that it's logically consistent. That's all. Because I point out with alpha zero, it's like if right now it's reasoning and it's intelligent, does it suddenly not become that once it's actually seen and solved every position? I don't know. Yeah, but I would argue that alpha zero, in a way, it is reasoning because of the Monte Carlo tree search. It's, it's looking at all of the possible future pathways and it's dynamically selecting a, a good one. So it's many steps, if that makes sense. It's imagining all of the possible future paths and it's selecting the best one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting. So this measure of intelligence paper, I did a thing about this, and this was by Francois Cholet, and he set a machine learning challenge to solve what is basically an intelligence test. So there's a few more examples. Yeah, so th this would be an example. So that goes to that goes to that goes to that as this goes to what? So we can clearly see what's going on here. We need to, this is a pattern which yep. has a symmetry. We need to fill in the black box and we need to output it. Now, from a machine learning point of view, this is bloody difficult. And the reason is you only have about three examples of something and then you need to generate the next one. So no deep learning algorithm will work here. And in order for you to solve this challenge, 
you need to create an algorithm which will know about all of the possible things that humans might do in this respect. Now, remember that the, the number of the grid size is different as well. Right? So here, for example, you would need to, to it would need to know about symmetry. It would need to know about objects. And this is the same conversation, right? Because a yeah. priori, you could pre-code it with every possible type of pattern. Because what you're essentially doing, um, he calls this developer aware generalization, which means you're building an algorithm to solve a task that you haven't seen before. And it's yeah. analogous. Because yeah, this you... thing would have to be so efficient that just given a couple of examples or something, it will learn the semantic pattern. And that's what we're talking about in the vision world. Yeah, because, for example, if you take a look at that, just the first image that just has the hole in it, right? You could pose this as, how can I modify this image to make it rotationally symmetric? And then the solution is immediate, right? Yeah. And so if you had a, if you had a, a machine learning algorithm that understood rotational symmetry, then it's a question that can be posed to that algorithm, which is search for an image that's rotationally symmetric by modifying these pieces. Yeah. But, but there are so many have... variations. What what if it was a, a rectangle and it was like a mirror symmetry through the middle? Uh, where you would just have to think of every possible transformation. And, that, and the well, transformation is the word, isn't it? Because we were talking about yeah. every possible transformation in the image world. Yeah, so it's really a good way to phrase that is, is transformationally invariant learning is what we're trying to think about here, transformational yeah, yeah. variant learning. And and look, I'm sure there are many imaginable transformations, and I have no doubt that we could construct intelligent tests that lots of humans would fail. Maybe all of them would fail it because they didn't notice that this is actually like, I don't know, 19-fold symmetry or something weird that we don't think about. But what I'm saying is that, and I bet if we went and looked at kind of these intelligent tests, intelligence tests, most of them are probably from a box of a very small, you know, box of potential transformations, right? And actually, so back in uh, graduate school, brain teasers were a really fun thing, right? We would always kind of exchange brain teasers, uh, give them to each other, kind of had a lot of fun with brain teasers. And it occurred to me that what's interesting is that brain teasers, often the, the solution to them kind of relies upon like a certain little thought or principle, right? Could be whatever. Maybe it's the idea of coloring. Like sometimes if you add an extra variable to something like a color, you can solve the problem easier. So a great example in computer science is the red-black tree. If you're trying to optimize uh, a binary tree. If you add in this notion of coloring things red and black, it actually leads you to a cool way in which to keep the tree balanced. And so I, I call these uh, prime thoughts because in a way they're the thoughts that every problem can be factored into. If somehow you knew and or were expert at applying every prime thought that was out there, you could be much better at solving problems. But the question is, are there uncountably many? So look, I, I undoubtedly, I'm sure that maybe there are, I don't know. There could be many. Um, there could be many more than humans will ever know. But what I'm saying is that right now, the state of neural networks, deep learning and whatnot, is that they know none of them. They sort of know, they, they know none of these prime thoughts. They know none of these transformations. And it's up to us to try and teach them all that through data augmentation, which leads to this overfitting problem because it just needs an absurd number of parameters. And so my point is just that I think if we start by just teaching them a small number, like how can we, let's do transformationally invariant learning with just five transformations. I think that would already be such a order of magnitude improvement that then we could revisit yeah. the question, right? Because there's another example here, which is denoising. Cholet makes the argument that we need to have some kind of core knowledge, which would yeah. uh, encapsulate all the things you said, because in, in his conception of intelligence, he says that essentially it's the generalization difficulty of a task in, in some scope divided by priors plus, plus experience. And at the moment, we are balancing on the experience side of things. So what we're doing is we're giving it loads and loads of experience of different permutations of the same thing, semantically equivalent, whereas a prior would be imbuing the knowledge about how to parse specific semantic information uh, from this situation with less example, with fewer examples. Yeah, so I think, I think it sounds like 
I would be on the same page with that. I, I made a video on it. My most recent video is all about this. We did okay. a two hour talk on street talk about it. And Yannick has made four videos about it. <laughs> so we've got loads of, but it's, it's called on the measure of intelligence, this paper. Gotcha, so we're, gotcha. Clearly we're all big fans of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what he's calling core knowledge or, or what, what I called prime thoughts long ago, <laughs> that's the point is that we need to we've got to encode this basic prior knowledge. Otherwise yeah. we're just, we're asking the networks we're asking the, uh, the deep learning networks to do a lot of busy work that we could have just yeah. told them up front and, and let them focus more. Because like you were saying, every lens is a, creates a spherical manifold and we project it onto a 2D surface. I actually have no doubt that if you had a neural network that understood affine invariance and whatnot, and also was able to calibrate for that, which is obviously more advanced than what a human being is going to do when they look at a a 2D image, I'm sure it would have applications, right? Whether it's in yeah. the medical field or, or x-ray image analysis or military targeting systems, like who knows? Like it would have very cool applications. I, I agree. I think the problem is computationally, it would involve so many different transformations that it might be computationally intractable. But well, I, this has been amazing. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Machine Learning Street Talk. We will see you back next week.